Bada bump. We got an interesting book to read here. It's called In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. And in this series, it is Kaylin does homework, and we're going to attempt to do my homework. I hope you enjoy. The village of Hokum stands on a high wheat plains of western Kansas, a lonesome area that other Kansans call out there. Some 70 miles east of the Colorado border, the countryside with its hard blue skies and desert clear air, has an atmosphere that is rather more far west than middle west. The local accent is barbed with parody twang, a, rage, a ranch hand, nasalness, and the men. Many of them wear narrow frontier trousers. Stetsons, a high heel boots with pointed toes, the land is flat, and the views are awesomely extensive. Horses, herds of cattle, a white cluster of grain elevators rising as gracefully as Greek temples are visible long before a traveler reaches them. Holcomb, too, can be seen from great distances. Not that there is much to see, simply an aimless congression of buildings divided in the center by a main line tracks from the Santa Fe Railroad, a haphazardly helmet bounded on the south by a brown stretch of the Arkansas, pronounced Arkansas River, on the north by a highway Route 50, and on the east and west by prairie lands and wheat fields. After rain, or when snow falls, thaw, the streets, unnamed, unshaded, unpaved, turn from the thickest dust into the dirtiest mud. At one end of the town stands a stark old stucco structure, the roof of which supports an electric sign, dance, but the dancing has ceased and the advertisement has been dark for several years. Nearby is another building with an irrelevant sign. This one is flanking gold on a dirty window. Holcomb Bank. The bank closed in 1933, and its former counting rooms have been converted into apartments. It is one of the town's two apartment houses. The second one, a ramshackle mansion known because a good part of the local school's facility lives there as a teacherage, but the majority of Holcomb's homes are one-story frame affairs with front porches. Down by the depot, the postmistress, a gaunt woman who wears a rawhide jacket and denims and cowboy boots, presides over a falling apart post office. The depot itself, with its peeling sculptor-colored co paint is equally melancholy. The chief, the super chief, the El Capitan, go by every day. But these celebrated expressions never pause there. No passenger trains do, only an occasional freight. Up on the highway, there are two falling stations, filling stations one of which doubles as a meagerly supplied grocery store, while the other does extra duty as a cafe. Hartman's Cafe, where Mrs. Hartman, the proper Tess, dispenses sandwiches, coffee, soft drinks, and 3.2 beer. Holcomb, like all the rest of Kansas, is dry. And that really is all. Unless you include as one must, the Holcomb School, a good-looking establishment which reveals a circumstance that the appearance of the community otherwise camouflages, that the parents who send their children to this modern and ably staffed consolidated school, the grades go from kindergarten through senior high, and a fleet of buses transport the students, of which there are usually around 360. 
from as far as 16 miles away are, in general, a prosperous people, farm ranchers, most of them, they're outdoor folk of very, very varied stock. German, Irish, Norwegian, Mexican, Japanese. They raise cattle and sheep, grow wheat, milo, grass seed, and sugar beets. Farming is always a chancy business, but in western Kansas, it's proctoneerings considering themselves born gamblers, for they must contend with an exceedingly shallow perception. The annual average is 18 inches, and anguishing irrigation problems, however, the last seven years have been years of droughtless beneficence. The farm ranchers in Finney County, of which Holcomb is part, have done well. Money has been made, not from farming alone, but also from the exploitation of plentiful natural gas resources. And its acquisition is reflected in the new school. The comfortable interior of the farmhouses, the steep and shallow grain elevators. Until one morning in mid-Kansas of 1959, a few Americans, in fact, few Kansans, had ever heard of Holcomb. Like the waters of the river, like the motorists, motorists of the highway, and like the yellow trains streaking down the Santa Fe tracks, drama, in the shape of exceptional happenings, had never stopped there. The inhabitants of the village, numbering 270, were satisfied that this should be so, quite content to exist inside ordinary life, to work, to hunt, to watch television, to attend school socials, choir practice, meetings at the H4 club, but then, in the earliest hours of the morning, in November, a Sunday morning, certain foreign sounds impinged on the normal nightly Holcomb noises. On the kneeling hysteria of coyotes, the dry scrape of scuffling tumbleweed, the racing and receding wail of locomotive whistles. At the time, not a soul in Sleeping Holcomb heard them. Four shotgun blasts that, all told, ended six human lives. But afterwards, the townspeople, their two four, sufficiently, oh, unfearfully, what, what the, this is a dumb, I can't read this, but, um, their, their two four, sufficiently, unfearful of each other to seldom trouble to lock their doors, found fantasy recreating them over and over. These somber explosions that stimulated fires of mistrust in the glare of which many old neighbors viewed each other strangely and as strangers. The master of River Valley Farm, Herbert William Clutter, was 48 years old and as a result of a recent medical examination for an insurance policy, known himself to be a fir in first-rate condition. Though he wore rimless glasses and was but average height, standing just under 5 feet 10, Mr. Clutter cut a man's man figure. His shoulders were broad, his hair had held its dark color. His square-jawed, his square -jawed, confident face retained a healthy-hued youthfulness, and his teeth unstained and strong enough, strong enough to shatter walnuts were still intact. He weighed a hundred and fifty-four, and the, the same as he had the day he graduated from Kansas State University, where he had majored in agriculture. He was not as rich as the richest man in Holcomb, Mr. Taylor Jones, a neighboring rancher. He was, however, the community's most widely known citizen, prominent both there and in Garden City, the close-by county seat where he had headed the building committee for the new completed First Methodist Church, an $800,000 edifice, edifice. He was currently chairman of the Kansas 
Conference of Farm Organizations, and his name was everywhere. Respectfully recognized among Midwestern agriculturalists, as it was in certain Washington offices where he had been a member of the Federal Farm Credit Board during the Eisenhower administration. This is a good book so far. Good book. Always certain of what he wanted from the world, Mr. Clutter had in large measure a... T a <sighs> having a stroke here. Mr. Clutter had in large measure obtained it on his left hand on what remained of a finger once mangled by a piece of farm machinery he wore a plain gold band which was the symbol a quarter century old of his marriage to the person who he had wished to marry the sister of a college classmate a timid pious delicious girl named bonnie fox who was three years younger than he she had given him four children, a trio of daughters, and then a son. The eldest daughter, Ivana, married, and the mother of a boy ten months old, lived in northern Illinois, but visited Holcomb frequently. Indeed, she and her family were expected within the fortnight, for her parents planned to a sizable Thanksgiving reunion for the Cutter clan which had its beginnings in Germany. The first immigrant cutler, or cotler, as the name was then spelled, arrived here in 1880. Fifty-odd oh, 50 kinsfolk had been asked, several of whom would be traveling from places as far away as Pat Palatka, Florida, nor did Beverly. The child, next in age, of Ivana, any longer reside at River Valley Farm. She was in Kansas City, Kansas, studying to become a nurse. Beverly was engaged to a young biology student of whom her father very much approved. Invitations to the wedding scheduled for Christmas week were already printed which left still li living at home the boy, Kenyon, who at fifteen was taller than Mr. Cutler, and one sister, a year older, the town darling Nancy. In regard to his family, Mr. Cutler had just one serious case of disquiet. His wife's health, she was nervous. She suffered little spells. She were the sheltering expressions used by those close to her. Not that the truth concerning poor Bonnie's afflictions was in the least a secret. Everyone knew she had been an on and off physician's patient the last half dozen years. Taking a drink? Yet even upon this shadowy, shadowed terrain, sunlight had very latently sparkled the past Wednesday. Returning from two weeks of treatment at the Wesley Medical Center in Wichita, her customary place of retirement, Miss Cutler, Cut Clutter, had brought scarcely credible tidings to tell her husband. With joy, she informed him that the source of her misery, so medical opinion had at last de decreed, was not in her head, but in her spine. It was physical, a matter of misplaced vertebra. Of course, she must undergo an operation, and afterwards, well, she willed be her old self again. Was it possible the tension, the withdrawals, the pillow-muted sobbing behind locked doors, 
all due to an out of order backbone? If so, then Mr. Clutter could then, addressing his Thanksgiving table, recite a blessing of unmarried gratitude. Ordinarily, Mr. Clutter's morning began at 6.30. Clanging milk pails and the whis 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 whispery clatter of the boys who brought them, two sons of a man of a hired man named Vic Irskik Irskik usually roused him. But today he lingered. Yet Vic Irskik's sons come and leave. For the previous evening, a Friday the 13th, <gasps> woo, spooky ghost day, had been a tiring one. Through a part, though in part exhilarating, Bonnie has resurrected her old self, as if serving up a preview of the normality, the regained vigor soon to be. She had roughed her lips, fussed with her hair, and wearing a new dress, accompanied him to the Holcomb School, where they applauded a student production of Tom Sawyer, that has black people in it, in which Nancy played Becky Thatcher. He had enjoyed it, seeing Bonnie out in public, nervous but nevertheless smiling. Talk ing to people, and they both had been proud of Nancy. She had done so well, remembering her all her lines and looking, as he had said to her in the course of backstage congratulations, just as beautiful, honey, as a real southern belle. Whereupon Nancy had behaved like one. Curtsying in her hoop-skirted costume, she had asked if she might drive into Garden City. The state theater was having a special 11.30 Friday the 13th spook show, and all of her friends were going. In other circumstances, Mr. Clutter would have refused his laws or laws. And one of them was, Nancy and Kiamam, too, must be home by ten on a weeknights, by twelve on Saturdays. But weekends, by the general events of the weekends, we evening had been consented, and Nancy had not returned home until almost two. He had heard her come in, and had called to her, for though he was not a man ever really to raise his voice, he had some plain things to say to her, statements that concerned less the lateness of the hour than the younger youngster who had driven her home, a school basketball hero, Bobby Rupp. Mr. Clutter. This book really likes Mr. Clutter. I don't know about him. Ah, uh, he's okay. Mr. Clutter liked Bobby and considered him, for a boy his age, which was seventeen, most dependable and gentlemanly. However, in the three years she had been permitted dates, <laughs> permitted dates, so dumb, uh, Nancy, popular and pretty as she was, had never gone out with anyone else, and while Mr. Clutter understood that it was the present national adolescent custom to form couples to go study and wear engagement rings, he was disappointed, particularly since he had not long ago been ax by accident surprised his daughter and the rep boy kissing. Oh no! He had then suggested that Nancy discontinue seeing so much of Bobby, advertising her that a slow retreat now would hurt less than an abrupt severance later, for, as he reminded her, it was a parting that must eventually take place. The Rupp family were Roman Catholics, the Clutters Methodist. In fact, that should in itself be sufficient to terminate whether whatever fancies she and this boy might have of some day marrying. Nancy had been reason reasonable at any rate, 
She had not argued, and now, before saying good night, Mr. Clutter secured from her a promise to begin a gradual break off with Bobby. Still, the innocent the incident had laminately put off his retiring time, which was ordinarily eleven o'clock. <sighs> Alright, he he didn't get sleep, and this is what happened the night before holy fuck this is a detailed book. You really must like this guy. As a consequence, it was Oh, the, I, I bet the whole family dies. Because there's four kids, a dad, and a mom. That's six people. And this book's about six people who fucking die. I, I really hope so. This, this is not fucking fun to hear about these people. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah. As a consequence, it was well after seven when he awakened on Saturday, November 14th, 1959. His wife always slept as late as possible. However, while Mr. Cutler was shaving, showering, and outfitting himself in whipcord trousers, a cattleman's leather jacket, and soft stirrup boots, he had no fear of disturbing her. They did not share the same bedroom. For several years, he had slept alone in the master bedroom on the ground floor of the house, a two-story, 14-room frame and brick 14 rooms. Yikes. Though Mr. Clutter stored her... Though Mrs. Clutter stored her clothes in the closets of this room and kept her few cosmetics and her myriad medicines in the blue tile and the glass brick bathroom adjoining it, she had taken for serious occupation a company Ivana's former bedroom, which, like Nancy's and Kayon's room, was on the second floor. The house, for the most part designed by Mr. Cutler, who there thereby provided himself a sensible and sedate, if not notably decorative architect, had been built in 1948. For forty thousand dollars, the rel the resale value was now sixty thousand dollars. Situated at the end of a long, line-like driveway, shaded by rows of Chinese elms, the handsome white house standing on an ample lawn was groomed Bermuda grass, impressed Holcomb. It was a place people pointed out. As for the interior, there was spongy displays of liver-colored carpet intermittently, intermittently established the glare of varnished resounding floors. An immense modernistic living room couch covered in nubby fabric interwoven with glittery strands of silver metal. A breakfast alcove featuring a banquet upholstered in blue and white plastic. This sort of furnishing was what Mr. and Mrs. Clutter liked, as did the majority of their acquaintances, whose homes, by and large, were similarly Furnished. Ooh, scusi. Uh. Other than a housekeeper who came in on weekdays, the clutters employed no household help. So since his wife's illness and the departure of the eldest daughter, Mr. Clutter had of necessarily learned, of necessity, learned to cook. Either he nor Nancy or Nancy but particularly Nancy, prepared the family's meals. Mr. Clutter enjoyed the, the chore and was excellent at it. No woman in Kansas baked a better loaf of salt-raising bread, and his celebrated coconut cookies were the first item to go in go at charity cake sales. But he was not a healthy eater. 
What What do you mean? Literally two pages ago, it says uh, he was the. Where is it? It said it's, he was like the perfection of health. What the fuck? Unlike his fellow ranchers, he even preferred Spartan's breakfasts. That morning, an apple and a glass of milk were enough for him. Because he touched neither coffee nor tea, he was accustomed to begin the day on a cold stomach. A cold, cold stomach. Good. The truth was, he opposed all stimulants, however gentle. He did not smoke, and of course he did not drink. Indeed, he had never tasted spirits, and spirits is, is, is alcohol beverages, if you didn't know, if you're retarded. Um, and was inclined to avoid people who had a circumstance that did not shrink his social circle as much as might be supposed. For the center of that circle was supplied by the member of the Garden City's First Methodist Church, a, con on a congregation. <laughs> Fuck. Fucking books make me struck out. A congregation totaling 1,700, most of whom were a abstentaneous, were as abstentaneous as Mr. Cutter could desire. While he was careful to avoid making a nuance of his views to adopt outside, to adopt outside his realm of extremely uncensoring manner, he, inf yeah. He informed them within his family and along the employers at River Valley Farm. Are you a drinking man? Was the first question he asked a job applicant. And even though the fellow gave a negative answer, he still must sign a work contract containing a clause that declared the argument instantly void if the employee should be discovered harboring alcohol. I'm sorry, Alicholo. There you go. A friend, an old pioneer rancher, Mr. Lynn Russell, had once told him, You've got no mercy, I swear, Herb. If you caught a hired man drinking out, he'd go, and you wouldn't care if his family was starving. It was perhaps the only criticism ever made to Mr. Clutter as an employer. Otherwise, he was known for his Equanimity, equanimity, his charitableness, and the fact that he paid good wages and distributed frequent bonuses. The men who worked for him and there. <sighs> what? The men who worked for him and there were sometimes as many as eighteen had small reason to complain. After drinking the glass of milk and putting a Fleecy lined cap. Mr. Clutter carried his apple with him. He didn't even eat his apple for lunch, breakfast. He just carried it with him. Carried his apple with him when he went out the door to examine the morning. It was ideal apple eating weather. What the fuck? Oh, it's too dark out. I can't eat this apple. Fuck. It's not ideal. How do you have ideal apple eating weather? It's just ideal stomach. It needs and wants, I guess. Palate taste, taste palate. Yeah, it's your, it's your tongue. Your tongue decides. I want this right now. It's a fucking craving, you retard. It's not the weather that discerns whether you eat it or not. Regardless, go forth. The wildest sunlight descended from the purest sky, and the easternly wind rustled without ripping loose. The last of the leaves of the Chinese elms. Autumn's reward. Western Kansas. For the evils that the remaining seasons impose. Winter's rough. Colorado winds and hip high. Sheep slaughtering snows. The slushes and the strange land fogs of spring and summer. When even crows seek the puny shade. And the tawny infinitude of wheat stalks bristle. Blaze. At last, after September, another weather arrives. An Indian summer that occasionally endures until Christmas. 
the the fuck okay what the fuck as mr clutter contemplated this superior specimen for the season he was joined by a part part colleen mongrel oh a part collie mongrel and together they ambled off towards the livestock corral which was adjacent to one of three barns on the premises one of these barns was a mammoth Quonset hut. It brimmed with grain. Westland Shrum. In one of them housed a dark pungent hill of Milo grain worth considerable money. A hundred thousand dollars. That figure alone represented at an almost four thousand percent advance over Mr. Cutler's entire income in nineteen four. Dear, he married Bonnie Fox and moved with her from their hometown of Roselle, Kansas, to Garden City, where he had found work as an assistant at the Finney County Agricultural Agent. Typically, he it, uh, excuse me. night time out there, night 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 time out there. <sighs> spoop spoop um we'll read a little bit more I think yeah we'll read up to page uh fuck might as well read up to this page I guess then um <sighs> we typically it took him just seven months to be promoted, that is, to install himself in the head man's job, the years during which he held the post, 1935 to 1939, encompassed the dis destinant, the down and outest the region had known since white men settled there, and young Herb Clutterter, having, as he did, a brain, Ha having, as he did, a brain expertly racing with the newest in streamlined agricultural practices, was quite qualified to serve a middleman between the government and the disappointed farm ranchers. These men could, well, use the optimism and the educated instruction of a likable young fellow who seemed to know his business. I f books are <sighs> Woo. all the same. He was not doing what he wanted to do. The son of a farmer, he had from the beginning aimed at operating a property of his own. Facing up to it, he resigned a country agent after four years. Oh. Sorry, I'll reread that. Facing up to it, he resigned a, as, country, as county agent after four years and on land leased with borrowed money created an embryo in embryo River Valley Farm, a name justified by the Arkansas River's meandering presence, but not certain, but not certainly by any evidence of valid. It was an endeavor that several Finney County conservatives it was an endeavor that several Finney County conservatives watched with show us amusement old timers who had been found fond of baiting the youthful county agent on the subject of his university notions. That's fine, Herb. You always know what's best to do on the other f fellow's land. Plant this, terrace that. But you might say a slight difference 
if the place was your own. This were mistaken. The upstart's experiments succeeded, partly because in the beginning years, he labored 18 hours a day. Setbacks occurred. Twice the wheat crop failed, and one winter he lost several hundred herd of sheep in a blizzard. But after a decade, Mr. Clutter's domain consisted of over eighty hundred, over 800 acres owned outright, and 3,000 more worked on a retail basis. And that, as, he, as his colleagues admitted, was a pretty good spread. Wheat, Milo, seed, certified grass seed, these were the crops the family's prosperity depended upon. Animals were also important, sheep and especially cattle. A herd of several hundred Hereford born bo a herd of several hundred Hereford bore the cutter clutter brand though one would not have suspected it from the scant contents of the livestock corral, which was reserved for ailing steers, a few milking cows, Nancy's cats, and Babe, the family favorite, old, an old fat workhorse who never objected to lumbering about with three or four children astride her broad back. Mr. Clutter had fed Babe the core of his apple, calling good morning to a man ranking, raking debris inside the corral. Alfred Steelock Trillerlin, the sole resident employee. The Steelock Trillerlin and their three children lived in a house not a hundred yards from the main house, except for them, the Clutters had no neighbors within half a mile. A few long, no. A lo what? Where are we reading this book? A long faced man with a long, with long brown teeth, Stocklachlan asked, have you some particular work in mind today? Cause we got a sick un, the baby, me and Mrs have been up and down with her most of the night. I've been thinking to carry her to doctor. And Mr. Clutter expressed sympathy, said by all means to take the morning off, and if there was any way he or his wife could help, please let them know. Then, with the dog running ahead of him, he moved southward toward the field. Lion-colored, with a luminous Illuminous, illuminosity, illum, luminously with now, what the fuck? Then, when the dog running ahead of him, he moved southward towards the fields, wine colored now, luminously golden, with after heaven, after harvest double. The river lay. In this direction, near its bank, stood a grove of fruit trees. Peach, pear, cherry, and apple. Fifty years ago, according to the according to the native memory, it would have taken a lumberjack ten minutes to axe all the trees in western Kansas. Every day, only cottonwoods and Chinese elms. Perennials were a cactus-like indifference to thirst are commonly planted however as mr clutter often remarked an inch more of rain and this county would be paradise eden on earth the little collection of fruit bearers growing by the river was his attempt to contrary contrive rain or no a patch of the paradise the green Apple scented Eden, he envisioned. His wife once said, My husband cares more about those trees than he does for his children, and everyone in Holcomb 
recalled the days a small disabled plane crashed into the peach trees. Herb was fit to be tied. Why the propeller hadn't stopped turning before he'd slammed a lawsuit on the pilot. Passing through the orchard, Mr. Clutter proceeded along beside the river, He was, sh which was shallow here and strewn with island, mainstream beaches of soft sand to which on Sundays, gone by hot weather, sun baths with Bonnie had still felt up to things. Picnic baskets had been carried, family afternoons wild away, waiting for a twitch at the end of a fishing fish line. Mr. Clutter seldom encountered trespasses on his property, a mile and a half from the highway, and arrived at an obscure at and arrived at by obscure roads. It was not a place that strangers came upon by chance. Now suddenly a whole party of them appeared, and Teddy the dog rushed towards roaring out a challenge. But it was odd about Teddy, though. He was a good sentry, alert, e even ready to rise, to rise Cain. His valor had one flaw. Let his glimpse a gun, as he did now. I, I, I put two and two together, guys. I was like, huh, talking about a guy getting shot? Huh. Talk about this guy and his family getting shot. Ooh, woo. This is an interesting book. I literally hate reading books. They're literally the most time-consuming things in fucking life. Stories are fun. I prefer thinking. Thinking is a story. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh my gosh. <sighs> Let's see what happens with the gun. Where is the gun at? Gun, 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 cow. For the intruders were armed, and his head dropped down, his tail turned in. No one understood why, for no one knew his history, other than that he was a vagabond Kenyan. What? Other than that he was a vagabond Kenyan had adopted years ago. The visitors proved to be five pheasant hunters from Oklahoma. The pheasant season in Kansas, a famed November event, lures hordes of sportsmen from adjoining states, and during the past week, plaid-headed regiments had paraded across the autumnal expanses, flushing and feeling with rounds of birdshot, great coppery flights with the grain flatting birds. By custom, the hunters, if they are not invited guests, are supposed to pay the landowner a fee for letting them pursue their quarry on his premises. But when the Oklahomans offered to, high, offered to hire hunting rights, Mr. Clutter was amused. I am not as poor as I look. Go ahead. Get all you can, he said, then touching the brim of his hat of his cap. He headed for home in the day's work, unaware that it would be his la ah, he, his last day of work. He's either retiring, which is very unlikely given the in-depth look into his life right here. He's going to die because it's his last day of work. He's dying. He's dead. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. He's dead. Four shots. Like Mr. Clutter, Clutter the young man... Wait, what the f- what did I miss? That's interesting. Oh, well. <sighs> like Mr. Clutter, the young man brec breakfasting in a cafe called the Little Jewel never drank coffee. He preferred root beer, three aspirin, cold root beer, and a chain of Paul Mall cigarettes. That was his notion of a proper chow down. Sipping and smoking. He studied a map spread on the counter before him, a Phillips 66 map of Mexico, but it was difficult to concentrate, for he was expecting a friend, and the friend was late. He looked out the window at the silent, small town, 
Street. A street had never been seen until yesterday. Oh, a street he had never seen until yesterday. Still, no sign of Dick. But he was sure to show up. After all, the purpose of their meeting was Dick's idea, his score. And when it was settled, Mexico, the map was ragged, so thumbed that it had grown as supple as a piece of chamos around the corner in his room at the hotel where he was staying were hundreds more like it worn maps of every state in the union every canadian providence every southern american country for the young man was an for the young man was an incessant conceiver of voyages not a few of which he had actually taken to Alaska, to Hawaii, and Japan, to Hong Kong. Now, thanks to a letter of investigation to a score here, he was with all his worldly belongings, one cardboard suitcase, a guitar, two big boxes of books, and maps, and songs, poems, and old letters, weighing a quarter of a ton. Dick's face, when he saw these boxes, Christ, Perry, you carry that junk everywhere? And Perry had said, What junk? One of them books cost me thirty bucks. Here he was in little old Loth, Kansas. Kind of funny if, if you th thought about it. Imagine being back in Kansas where only four months ago he had sworn first to the state parole board, then to himself that he would never set foot within its boundaries again. Well, it wasn't for long. Ink, ink, ink circled names populated the map. Kozume, an island off the coast of Yucatan, where, so he had read in a men's magazine, you could shed your clothes, put on a relaxed grin, live like a Rahaj, Raja, and have all the women you want for $50 a month. From the same article, he had memorized other appealing statements. Kozulum is a holdout against social, economic, and political pressure. No official publishes any private personal, any private person no official pushes any private person around on this is land. This island. Fucking retarded spacing of these fucking words. And every year, flights of parrots come over from the mainlands to lay their eggs. Archipelago. No. Acapulco. Connoted deep sea fishing casinos anxious rich women and sierra madre meant gold meant treasure of the sierra madre a movie he had seen eight times it was bogart's best picture but the old guy was playing the prospector the one who reminded perry of his father was terrific too Walter Houston, yes, and what he had told Dick was true. He did know the ins and outs of hunting gold, having been through them by his father, having been taught them by his father, who was a professional prospector. So why shouldn't they, the two of them, buy a pair of pack horses and try their luck at the Syria? Madre, but Dick, the practical Dick, had said, Whoa, honey, whoa, I see that show ends up everybody nuts on account of fever and blood suckers, mean conditions all around. Then, 
when they got the gold, remember, a big wind come along and blew it all away. Perry folded the map. He paid for the root beer and stood up, sitting. He had seemed a more than normal sized man, a powerful man, with the shoulders and arms, the thick, crutching torso of a weightlifter. Weightlifting was, in fact, his hobby. Wow. <sighs> wow. Um, hobby, hobby, hobby. But some sections of him were not in proportion to others. His tiny feet, encased in short black boots with steel buckles, would have neatly fitted into a delicate lady's dancing slippers. When he stood up, he was no taller than a 12-year-old child and suddenly looked st struggling on the stunned legs that seemed grotesquely inadequate to the grown-up bulk they supported. Not like a well-built truck driver, but like a retired jockey. Mm -hmm. But like a retired jockey, overblown and muscle-bound. Outside the drugstore, Perry stations himself in the sun. It was a school. It was a quarter to nine, and Dick was a half an hour late. However, in the next twenty-four hours, how? Yeah, if oh, however, if Dick had not hummered home the every minute importance of the next twenty-four hours, he would not have noticed it. Time rarely waited upon him. For he had many, he had had many methods of passing it. Among them, mirror gazing. Dick had often, Dick had once observed, every time you see a mirror, you go into a trance, like, like you was, looking at some gorgeous piece of butt. I mean, my God, don't you ever get tired? Far from it, his own face enthralled him. Every angle of it introduced a different impression. It was a changing face, challenging face, and mere guidance, guided experiments had taught him how to, to, what the, f what, hello? Taught him how to, okay. Ring the changes, how to look now ominous, now impish, now sourful, a touch of the head, a twist of the lips, and the corrupt gypsy became the gentle romantic. His mother had been a full-blooded Cherokee. It was from, from her that he had inherited his coloring the iodine skin, the dark moist eyes, the black hair, which he kept brillianted, brilliant, not a word, it's tough read, brilliantated, and was plentiful enough to provide him with sideburns and a slip Free spray of bangs. His mother's donation was apparent. That of his father, a freckled, gingery haired Irishman, was less so. It was as though the Indian blood had routed every trace of the Celtic strain. Still, pink lips and a perky nose confirmed its presence, as did a quality of r roguish animation of upper Irish egotism which often activated the Cherokee mask and took control completely when he played the guitar and sang singing and the thought of doing so in front of an audience was another mesmeratic way of whistling hours. He always used the same mental scenery. A nightclub in Las Vegas which happened to be his hometown. 
It was an elegant room filled with celebrities excited, excitedly focused on the sensation, on the sensational new star, rendering his famous back by violins version of "I'll Be Seeing You," and encoring with his latest self-accompanied ballad. Every April, every April flights of parrots fly overhead, red and green, green and tangerine. I see them fly, I hear them high, singing parrots, bringing April spring. Dick, on first hearing the song, had commented, parrots don't sing. Talk, maybe, holler, but they sure as hell don't sing. Of course, Dick was very literal minded, very. He had no understanding of music, poetry, and yet, when you got right down to it, Dick's literalness had prag his pragmatic approach to every subject was the primary reason Perry had been attracted to him. For it made Dick seem. Wait, so Perry's attracted to Dick. Haha, <laughs> child joke. Haha. <laughs> For it had made Dick seem, compared to himself, so authentically tough, invulnerable, totally masculine, nevertheless pleasant at this Las Vegas revise was. It paled beside another of his visions. Since childhood, for more than half his 31 years, he had been sending off for literature. Fortunes in diving. Train at home in your spare time. Make big money fast in skin and lung diving. Free book, let's. Answering advertisements. Sunken treasure. 50 genuine maps. Amazing offer. That stoked the longing to realize an adventure. His imagination swiftly and over the other enabled him to experience. The dream of drifting downwards through strange waters of plummaging towards a green sea. Dusk. Sliding past the scaly, savage-eyed predators of a ship's hook that loomed ahead. A Spanish galleon, a drowned cargo of diamonds and pearls, a heaping casks of gold, a car horn honked. At last, Dick. And with that, Dick, that concludes episode one of Kaylin Does Homework. Um, like, comment, and subscribe if you made it this far, and we will start to continue the book tomorrow.